I think we should get started here. Um, my name is Michael Soffer. I'm the vice president <laughs> of the Hyde Park Historical Society, and with me are Dottie Jeffries and Carol Veith. Uh, we are sort of the coordinators of the Hyde Park Book Club, which is sponsored by the Hyde Park Historical Society in the Chicago Hyde Park Village. Tonight, we are welcoming Blair Kamen and Lee Bay, who um, Blair is the author of Who is the City For? with photographs by Lee Bay. Bay. And we're just delighted to have them tonight. Um, well, you know, I would encourage yeah. all of you, if you enjoy this program, this book club meeting, to go to our website at www.hydeparkhistory.org to uh, check us out and maybe um, become a member or make a donation. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dottie, who is going to introduce our guests tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to introduce Blair Kamen and Lee Bay, once rival critics, who will discuss their new book, Who is the City For?, published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, I first met Lee and, <clears throat> and Blair in the 90s when I was doing architecture-related publicity. Um, Blair was the Chicago Tribune's architecture critic for 28 years, from 1992 to 2021, and was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for criticism for a series of articles about the problems and promise of Chicago's greatest public space, its lakefront. And he's the author of several books, author or editor of several books, including Why Architecture Matters, Lessons from Chicago. Welcome, Blair. Thank you. And Lee Bay is an editorial writer and architecture critic for the Chicago Sun-Times. He is also a photographer, author, and lecturer. Previously, former Mayor Richard M. Daly's Deputy Chief of Staff for Architecture and Urban Planning, Lee's photographs have been published in the New York Times and Architectural Digest, to name a few platforms. Three years ago, Lee was at the book club to discuss his book, Southern Exposure, The Overlooked Architecture of Chicago's South Side. And in 2019, Lee presented a program for the Historical Society on Diversity and Preservation. So welcome back, Lee. Thank you. Good to be back. And may I just say that the team of, of Blair Kamen and Lee Bay joins a Chicago tradition of rival critics collaborating, most famously movie critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert, and rock music critics Greg Cott and Jim DeRogatis. <laughs> so Blair and Lee, the program is yours. Thank you so much, Nadia. We are really thrilled to be um, here tonight and to have a chance to um, engage in dialogue with the uh, book club of the most opinionated zip code in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> zip codes. I say that as uh, an honorary Hyde Parker, a former honorary Hyde Parker, uh, our older son went to lab school years ago. Um, we lived on the north side, but we commuted down and we're in part of the Little League and a lot of other things. So I feel like I know uh, the neighborhood pretty well, and I know Lee does, uh, knows it well too. Um, so um, tonight we're, um, it's appropriate that it's um, Martin Luther King Day um, uh, because our book, uh, the subtitle is Architecture, Equity and the Public Realm. Uh, Lee and I um, do architecture criticism in a uh, very Chicago, uh, kind of way. We don't just look at buildings uh, as aesthetic objects, although we judge them that way. We also analyze their impact on people. Uh, rightly, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the foundational aspects of our approach to criticism, yes? Yeah, it's so true. I mean, going back to before you and at the Sun Times, uh, Bill Newman, um, uh, but before me, uh, a generation or half generation before me, uh, the idea is to not write about architecture as a beauty contest, but to really talk about um, how the built environment either makes things better, worse, or neutral for, um, uh, for the people it's supposed to serve. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I think, is that, 
Um, sorry, Michael, is that sound that we're hearing that little? No. Yeah. Is that? Uh, no. That's probably my computer. I will try to mute that. Okay, no problem. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, this is, I mean, as, as Dottie mentioned, um, uh, this was an interesting exercise because Lee and I had been rivals uh, and then we became a team of rivals um, when I asked him to take photographs for the book. Um, we have joked um, throughout our book tour that uh, one of us is Gene, the other one is Roger. Uh, and whenever we argue, we sort of, you know, get into the whole Siskel and Ebert thing. Um, but anyway, I, I think that tonight what we're going to do is um, we're going to interview each other. Uh, and Lee's going to start off by interviewing me about the text of the book. And I'm going to interview him about the photos of the book, which I think all of you are going to find absolutely fascinating. Because every time Lee talks about his photos, I learn new things. Uh, and so, Lee, do you want to start with, um, you know, start off? Sure, sure. Now, now um, this book comes after the end of your term uh, as architecture critic for the Tribune. Yeah. Um, uh, but yet, it, it's not this sort of nostalgic look back over your your career, and I didn't think it would be. But it really takes your your columns, um, particularly okay. those last ten years, and, and gives it a new context in a way. Uh, talk about that a bit. Talk about the last ten years. Um, changes in the city. They always like to revisit those last ten years. And well, um, the book um, consists of fifty-five um, columns that originally appeared in the Chicago Tribune from uh, roughly twenty eleven to um, twenty twenty one when I left the paper, and the it's the. Um, third time I've done a collection of columns with the University of Chicago Press. It kind of each um, book I've done with them is covers a, roughly a decade. So when I left the Tribune um, two years ago, I figured that I would try to finish the trilogy, as it were. Uh, although uh, I would not have anyone named Frodo or Gandalf uh, in my trilogy, like Lord of the Rings. Um, but the idea was to organize the columns um, thematically rather than chronologically. So the book has essentially five sections. Um, the middle sections have to do with urban design, architecture, wow. and historic preservation. And then the first and fifth um, pair uh, high profile politicians. And uh, the first chapter uh, has to do with the Chicago projects of uh, Donald Trump and Barack Obama. And then the last one, the last chapter compares uh, the urban design approaches of Rahm Emanuel and Lori Lightfoot. Um, so the columns also, many of the columns also have postscripts. Perfect. So um, for example, th those postscripts are updates essentially, which tell you how the story turned out. Um, so, for example, um, you know, I'm known, of course, for being a, an adversary of the uh, most narcissistic president in the history of uh, the union. Uh, so, uh, you know, after our battle over the sign that he uh, stuck on his uh, uh, pretty attractive Chicago skyscraper, the update tells you that... Um, in response to the controversy, Rahm Emanuel passed a sign, a riverfront sign ordinance, uh, and um, that ensured that there would be no future uh, giant signs that were half as long as a football field with 20 foot high letters, uh, 15, you know, roughly only 15 stories above uh, the riverfront. But those columns really, I think, get to the heart of what the book is about which is the question of who is the city for? So in other words, should the riverfront with its beautiful new river walk be a setting for Donald Trump to flaunt his ego? Or should there be sign controls which recognize that this is a public space, that we don't want a cacophony of signs that ruin the beauty 
of that public space. And that is a thread that runs through the entire book from, you know, in the other chapters that I mentioned. Nope, oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. Indeed, such a compelling question on the face of the book, who is the city for? Um, who is the city for? I mean, and is the, and is the uh, answer consistent throughout the 234 square miles of this joint? Mm, good question. Well, the city in theory should be for everyone. It should provide basic opportunities for everyone, for pa good parks, good transit, um, obviously other things that go beyond the built environment like education. Um, the, I think people in Hyde Park know that, um, you know, my work has often, one of the hallmarks of my work has been um, this whole question of asking about equity. Um, I did, you know, the series I did in 1998 about the lakefront looked at the inequities between the North Lakefront and the South Lakefront, um, extending from essentially McCormick Place South to Promontory Point. And since then, um, you know, all of you Hyde Parkers know that there's been a dramatic difference in um, in the lakefront with new the new pedestrian bridges, the new um, uh, marina uh, around uh, 31st Street, um, slightly larger uh, beaches and grounds uh, because of new landfill in the lake. So those things are, um, you know, we, I mean, the the we the the point of the book is not to say that um, it's not socialism. <laughs> we you know we can't in in the world we live in not everything is going to be equal. In in a city there are going to be d dramatic differences of wealth and poverty, but at the same time um, we don't want to see. The, one of the points of the book is that those who need um, <laughs> excuse me, public spaces, good public spaces most are often the people who don't have a lot of resources, who don't have, you know, who don't live in Gold Coast apartments or um, things like that. So the, the idea is to, um, to spread the wealth of, um, you know, of the public realm. And one of the key concepts of the book really has to do with the just uh, definition of equity. In other words, we think of typically we use equity uh, to mean that fair treatment for neighborhoods that have often gotten the short end of the stick. But I also use equity in this book, as you know, um, playing on the financial meaning of the word, the plural meaning of the word is in equities as in shares of stock. And the point here is not that we should try to maximize profit as in, as you know, you do on Wall Street, but you try to maximize opportunity and the quality of public space that people share. So the lakefront is a, you know, is a prime example of that. Now the South Lakefront is a much better public space. Um, and that benefits, I think, both, uh, you know, Hyde Park and the neighborhoods, North Kenwood, Oakland, uh, you know, to the north. And it benefits the whole city because it takes some pressure off of the highly overcrowded Lincoln Park um, on the North Lake front. So I think equity, part of the idea here is to complicate the meaning of equity. And, um, you know, we see that uh, throughout the book. You know, um, talk about, um, you know, those 10 years of it and help, help us put into better context. I mean, you're coming as a city, we're coming off a 22 year reign of Richard Daly. Right. Um, Jim Daly. Uh, we have uh, a new and unfamiliar mayor uh, and, and Rahm Emanuel, um, who doesn't want it for 22 years himself, as, as we see. And, um, you know, Daly's reign is, you know, uh, it's, it was mixed field in, in some respects, but also, um, uh, you know, Millennium Park and, it, and uh, you know, putting money into the physical plan of schools. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about Rahm Emanuel's um, two terms in the built environment. What did he bring us that you talk about? And otherwise, and then bring us into where Lori is now, Lori Light, Mayor Lori Lightfoot is now. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And 
um, most of the book deals with Rahm Emanuel's term. Rahm Emanuel was similar to Daly in the sense that he was a pragmatic centrist and he tried to use architecture and urban design to demonstrate that as a ruler, he could get things done. And so there are a lot of, you know, Rahm did some pretty good things. Uh, the boathouses by Jeannie Gang along the north and south branches of the Chicago River. Um, Which are in your book. I'm sorry? Which are in your book. Yes, absolutely. Right, exactly. And um, the Riverwalk, uh, Daly had started it, but Rahm really uh, extended it um, and really completed it. And that is probably, I mean, the Riverwalk is like, if if Millennium Park is Daly's greatest public space achievement, the Riverwalk is probably Rahm Emanuel's greatest public space achievement. The other thing about Rahm that's interesting is that many of his um, public works were linear in character. He was very interested in transit. So, you know, there, there are essays in the book about new transit stations, uh, some in the loop, one that looks uh, like a Calatrava, uh, project, the one at Washington uh, that is a gateway to Millennium Park, but also um, a, a new uh, station at 95th Street uh, that now we hope is going to be uh, uh, not the terminus of the red line, but the gateway to the extension of the red line that you, you know, so beautifully campaign for in your editorials at the, at the Sun-Times. Anyway, so the problem with Ron, though, is that a lot of the efforts on public works were fairly sporadic. So you had things like the Whole Foods in Englewood, which was kind of like, you know, a lot of show and not a lot of go. It, it didn't last. It, you know, it's closed. Um, it was kind of more razzle-dazzle than real substance. Rom did not have a systematic approach, and nor did Daly, to rebuilding um, communities devastated by decades of disinvestment and discrimination and deindustrialization. So, Lori Lightfoot clearly reacts to that, and when she comes in, um, it's interesting. Maurice Cox, her chief planner does an interview and he says, a city has a heart, the downtown, and a soul, the neighborhoods. And at that point it was like 2018 and the pandemic you know, hadn't happened yet and everything was rolling along downtown. And he, Maurice said, I'm gonna focus on the soul of the city, the neighborhoods, because I believe in equity and I want us to rebuild 10 neighborhoods the commercial corridors in 10 neighborhoods. So that really was the philosophical genesis of the Invest Southwest program that um, has come up with plans for reviving 10 commercial corridors in neighborhoods from Austin to Englewood, uh, Bronzeville, and other places. Now, the tricky part is that for Lori is that these plans look good on paper, but right now, they're still on paper for the most part. And so they promise things like, you know, health hubs and apartments, um, the preservation of historic buildings, like a beautiful Art Deco bank that you wonderfully photograph that we'll talk about later on in Austin. But the problem for Lori is that she doesn't have a lot of concrete stuff to point to. And the Tribune had a story over the weekend saying that some of the projects that are encountered in Invest Southwest have been, you know, we're already underway under Rahm Emanuel. Well, okay. Um, honestly, can you, I don't... Can you, can, you, can you talk? I know it's like you're all talking about your old home, but can you talk a bit about that story and what, what you thought of it? Yeah, I thought there was a little bit of gotcha in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, the Riverwalk had already been started by Daly. You know, and Rahm Emanuel took up the baton and ran with it. Um, I think Lori deserves a lot of credit for turning the uh, oil tanker that is the city of Chicago in the right direction. In other words, she really wants to try to redevelop these areas. The problem for her is that, um, excuse me, 
problem for her is that it's not there yet. People can't touch it. They can't touch it like they could see and touch the median planners that, you know, daily put down the middle of Michigan Avenue. And what they can see, unfortunately, is on the evening news every night, they can see carjackings, they can see murders, they can see all this stuff that suggests disorder, that the city is out of control. And, you know, and then, and then there's her very combative personality, which is a whole nother issue that as an architecture critic, I'm not really going to deal with. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, that's her problem. And I mean, she was dealt a very tough hand, obviously, with um, with COVID, you know, extremely difficult to govern under these circumstances. And then, of course, the unrest that uh, followed George's, George Floyd's murder. Um, and so, you know, she's got a tough road to hoe. And um, the book concludes by asking the question, what can architecture and urban design realistically hope to achieve in combating these, you know, endemic, systematic problems that have, that have uh, affected, you know, neighborhoods, struggling neighborhoods on the South and West sides? Well, that's a good question. Let's, let's, can we answer that? I mean, what can it do? I mean, we see at least, at yeah. least we see, for instance, cosmetically, if nothing else, when the old housing projects came down, the buildings that replaced them uh, physically looked better, uh, yeah. by and large. I mean, it's a whole other conversation about what happened to the people who live there. That's two or three other book club discussions. Uh, right. Take that one up. But, but, it, but, but what's the potential, at least, for architecture to do that good thing? I think that you and I would agree that architecture can't solve these problems alone, but architecture sh should and must be part of the solution to rebuilding these neighborhoods. So in other words, like in Austin, we there's, as your book pointed out uh, about the South side in Austin on the West side, there's, um, you know, wonderful uh, potential in the Laramie State Bank building that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, a beautiful Art Deco building on West Chicago Avenue. And, you know, instead of the kind of um, approach to city planning, which levels the city and, you know, wipes the slate clean, um, Maurice Cox is trying to follow an approach which actually was followed in Hyde Park interestingly during during redevelopment with small scale modern insertions into the urban fabric and this is like you know the townhouses that I am pay uh and Harry Weiss designed uh monoxide alley I think it's called on uh the I am pay building uh on uh, I think it's 53rd or 55th anyway everyone will no, and correct me on that. But in other words, that's the the idea is to mix uses, get street traffic, um, bring commercial corridors that are the gateways uh, of their neighborhoods, you know, lift them up, uh, create higher density and um, create economic opportunity and the and the opportunities for generational wealth um, that go along with, you know, development. So this is the potential of these efforts. The plans are very solid. They're brand new. They had not been cooked up under Rahm Emanuel's administration. They're, you know, Lori deserves credit for them. Um, so, you know, it's a good program. And whether or not she is reelected, that program, it's in my view, it's essential that that program continue and be expanded because you can't have a good city without it. I mean, the you know, the one of the points of the book is that you can't have a good city if you don't have a an equitable city. The city needs to be for everybody. You can't just have, you know, uh, the bean and a great downtown with Michelin-starred restaurants and zillion-dollar condos. That's not the definition of a great city. That's a great downtown. But that isn't enough. You know, if you really want to build a great city, you've got to have opportunities throughout the city. And that's, you know, so I think that's the essential point of the book.
Um, should we, I think it would be, since we were just talking about Laramie State Bank, do you want to, um, uh, I'll be happy to turn the tables here and, uh, you know, uh, talk to you about some of your photographs, wonderful photographs of the book. Um, can we do that? Sure, sure. And uh, let's get started here. We've got some questions coming up already, which is good. So hopefully we can leave time at the end to get to a particularly, particularly the soldier field question. Um, hold on. Let's get this thing going. <laughs> All right. Well, I've added a few more to the collection, uh, online collection, Blair, since we've last done this. So I thought we could start here. Um, this was um, obviously a photograph of the bean that's on the cover of the book. Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate. Um, I know you're asking me questions, but I want to ask you the question about why was it important to have this on the cover? Well, first of all, it's a wonderful shot. Um, I love the shot, the, just the clarity of it, the, the way it captures the bean. Um, the bean is kind of the symbol of what Chicago wants to be, this kind of glamorous uh, world capital. Um, and yet, you know, one could look at the bean in a way as the kind of ultimate uh, distracting shiny object, <laughs> you know, that diverts our attention from what's going on in the rest of the city. Um, maybe we should tell the little inside baseball here, but kind of fun. Um, what exactly, how did Anish Kapoor react to uh, seeing this uh, photograph of the of the bean on the cover. Should we talk about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, he, he, yes, we can. And, you know, I guess he reacted in a typical Chicago way. <laughs> Although he's not a Chicagoan, which is give me my money, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Where's but, mine? <laughs> where's mine? Like, with my hand out, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how the University of Chicago resolved that, so I shouldn't I shouldn't make too many jokes. But, um, you know, what I've forgotten about was that the was that Cloud Gate is... Uh, under, under copyright, uh, even the images of it all. And right. uh, so when you brought up on the cover of the book, uh, we got a, a, a notice from the, uh, from the publisher saying that, uh, you know, Anish Kapoor was looking for uh, some justice, I guess, uh, behind us, us using this. Uh, but at least, at least we didn't have to take it off, right? I mean, we didn't have to, you know, re, you know reprint the book without it. But, yeah. Uh, who is the bean for? It's for Anish Kapoor to rake in a few extra bucks. That's right. That's right. Um, you, know, you know, and it's kind of funny how that goes. You know, there's this old thing with the Picasso, right? I think, uh, who was the guy who settled that? Art Hodes, um, uh back in the 60s, where, you know, cut the, cut, the, cut the Picasso, which they started making models of at some point shortly after, who owned the copyright on that? And I guess it was litigated. And of course, it belongs to the people. Uh, so if we put the Picasso in front, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Lee, can you describe, um, tell the audience what camera you used? Because, and, and also the challenges and advantages of shooting in black and white. Sure, sure. Uh, now, you know what? Uh, I should have that camera ready, but I don't. But I, but I do have the lens, um, which is this, oh man, this great Canon lens. Uh, which has this great, um, those of you who shoot will recognize this, has this great bulb of a, of a, the lens and flat, it's, it, it's rounded to get the, the angles in. So it's a, it's a, it's a wide angle lens and it's a tilt shift lens, a perspective control lens, which allows me to photograph the building in a way uh, that allows the angles to stand up uh, so that the buildings to stand up. You know, sometimes when you photograph a thing that's taller than you, you took the camera up so they can get it all in, and it makes the buildings look like they're kind of falling. And this is to kind of correct that. Um, the good thing about black and white is, um, and this is the first time I shot a project in black and white, is that um, Blair and the University of Chicago Press let me know before the shutter fell, you know, on the first image, that it was gonna be in black and white. So uh, the print results. So I still shoot it in color, right? Oddly enough, I process it digitally in black and white, but I shoot it differently and then I'm looking for, I am at least, I'm looking for brighter days, I'm looking for a moodier sky, uh, I'm looking for the sun to strike the um, buildings in just the right way to bring out line and shadow and crispness. And um, 
Uh, and, you know, and that was the case here. Of course, with this one, I had to stand far enough back so that you can't find me in the crowd, the reflection of the crowd in the beam. If you look real close, you can see me. I'm the first guy, obviously, uh, in the middle of the beam there. Uh, hmm. uh, but, uh, but, you know, but I, I could be anyone. Right. Wait, wait for the right day. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's the case here. It was, it was, it was, it was fun. I mean, I, I'd like to do another black and white project. If yeah. I can. yeah, it's a great shot. What else do you have to show us? Well, here's Laramie State Bank that you mentioned. Oh, right. This is uh, the South uh, Invest Southwest uh, project that's in Austin. It takes this beautiful, um, I used to live in Oak Park for 12 years, so I would purposely drive by this and other great architecture in, in Austin. It takes this beautiful, you know, 1929 uh, Art Deco Bank, uh, which is kind of golden, has this golden model terracotta facade and it's a facade and if you look very closely there's all kind of images in it like coins and people trading wheat and all those kind of things that kind of get across the idea of thrift and 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 commerce that kind of thing um and this building closes when i first saw this building as a city news reporter back in 88 i think it was still a bank in the citizens bank and then shortly after that it kind of becomes this this almost indoor mall of stuff and then nothing after that uh, unfortunately, the great interiors are, are you know, beat to hell by uh, decay, but this exterior is still there. So what I wanted to do with, in this case was to show it not full on, like you saw with the bean. The bean I wanted to show full on with the backdrop of the of Chicago behind it. Here, I just wanted to look for an odd angle that would make you look at this picture a little bit longer uh, than maybe you would have. So you see the, you know, you see the um, the modernist. Uh, 1920s modernist lettering. You see the weathering on the building as well, but you also see the, see the potential uh, that that that's there. So I wanted to, and and then uh, likewise, likewise, uh, I'm waiting for a time of the day. I want to say I shot this. All of these, are, most of these are shot late summer. So I want to say it's about 5:30 or so when I shot this, and um, from across the street, obviously, and it was just the right time of the day to get that and shadow that tree and get that vine kind of showing there so yeah yeah it's a beautiful shot i mean and this building you know is the uh part, as part of invest southwest um this is a, a good example of how the city wants to use existing historic structures and repurpose them this building would have a retail and i think maybe a blues museum uh and right next to it there would be a um an apartment building uh, just to the west on Chicago Avenue. In addition, the city plans to improve the streetscape of um, of West Chicago Avenue. One of the things that is really striking if you're going from Austin into Oak Park is just how the street changes so dramatically. Uh, when you hit Oak Park, there are trees, mature trees. There are beautiful, there's beautiful brickwork. There are storefronts that are um, full uh, and in Austin, it's a it's a very very different situation. So that's a real that's a classic example of um, you know disinvestment and and then um, what what that has wreaked on neighborhoods like Austin. Uh, what else, uh, Lee? Well, we've got an old friend, uh, the former Cook County Hospital. Uh, this is um, uh, you know now it's a it's a it's a hotel and a food emporium and. Lord knows what else is in there. Uh, retail space available, so maybe if there's room, we can get something else going on in there. Uh, but I, just, you know, there's so much here that I like. And, and as we've talked before, Blair, you know, you know, I was born here, and most of us have uh, had either are or we've lived here for decades. And we remember when the hospital, when it was, this was a hospital. And, and what attracted me to this view was, I've been very few of us, certainly uh, not, not I, was aware that the hospital building was quite this beautiful. Um, and with the restoration, and this is a building like many that was almost lost you know, 20 years ago, uh, but, but with the rehab and restoration, we're seeing what a good looking building this is. And, and um, there's, there's everything here from you know, sheriffs to cherubs, cherubs to, you know, uh, kind of like almost a proto-modernist entry uh, uh, there that's dead in front of us. You got lamps, you got uh, uh, urn, you got everything there. And, uh, you know, all the makings of a fine hotel and or a great museum. And to think that it was began its life and lived most of its life 
as a as a hospital uh, for for the poor uh, shows a lot about what the city was saying at the time uh, about people who were you know maybe down in the look a bit um, about creating a welcoming space for them, which in many respects echoes the the theme of the book, right? Um, yeah, the, it's a it's a palace. It's a yeah, it's a palace of 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 um, healing, and it's a palace that you know, was often called the kind of uh, Ellis Island of Chicago, uh, not really an immigration gateway as Ellis Island was, but a place where many newcomers to the city, um, you know, who were many of whom were poor, got uh, world-class health care. And the architecture really reflects that, that, you know, um, it's not a rundown um facility it's a you know it's it could be i mean if 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 you told someone that you you know that this was like uh, louis the 16th uh <laughs> palace at versailles you know they might uh they might have they might buy that argument because it is so uh the ornament is so lush so but this was interesting because this picture accompanied a column which reviewed the uh, re the restoration uh, or renovation, I should say, and reinvention of Cook County Hospital, as you said, it, it's now a hotel and has other uses. Um, but this building, you know, for a while, um, John Stroger wanted to get rid of it. And when you look at it, I mean, when you look at the detail and, uh, you know, all the glorious uh, ornament here, you know, what that would have been a crime. Uh, it would have been the equivalent of, you know, getting rid of uh, Penn Station in New York City uh, that happened in the 60s. I mean, so thank goodness that this building was um, preserved and reinvented. And it's, you know, and, and it was ser um, serendipitous, I think, that it reopened during the pandemic because it really, sh you know, people really... Um, it, it underscored how, you know, health professionals, nurses, doctors, and others were, you know, not just technicians, but humanists, you know, people who were heal healers. Uh, and the architecture, I think, really reinforced that, uh, that identity in the building. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, um, and we see, this is a, this is a uh, from the book. If you look real closely, you can see why it's a little blurry, because again, I'm shooting with a manual lens. Uh, but those gentlemen at the, at the right there, those guys are, they, they're part of a wedding party. And uh, so they, you know, so they're out actually taking photographs. The guy to the far right is a, is a photographer. And that just goes to show you, along with uh, blurry as it is, uh, the rest of the building, of the transformation that this building um, has undergone. You would, if we were having this conversation in 1993, uh, you, it wouldn't have been people in their finest you know, looking to get their picture taken outside of this. It would have been, in fact, it probably would have been this, um, Harrison Ford running into this place, you know, at the camera looming behind him as we're right. going to find one of our man's history in the future. But again, you know, this goes to show what this place is now. And these guys, you know, you know, somewhere in here is the groom at the very least, his groomsmen, and they're looking to get their photographs taken in front of this building. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad the building was, you know, saved for reasons that have to do with architecture, but also with media. Um, you know, the memories, so many people have memories of this building, you know, from the fugitive uh, or from ER, uh, you know, on which, you know, the, the, the TV show that uh, for which, you know, Cook County really was a basis. So, I mean, it, it's, you know, we often think about landmarks, the preservation of landmarks is, as the great downtown buildings, buildings that were designed by like Louis Sullivan, the, you know, the Sullivan Center at the corner of State and Madison, but there are also uh, great landmarks out in the neighborhoods and that give, you know, these are anchors of uh, their neighborhoods and they create, you know, just tremendous identity for the city of Chicago and, uh, you know, to to have lost this building would have been really a, a tragedy and a travesty. And so thank God that uh, it was saved and, you know, you captured its, its renovation so well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, well, this, this, of course, uh, this is one of the things under law, right? Uh, this is a combination of public housing at the top and a public library. They're 
I don't know, I keep forgetting the layer four or five. I think four built under ROM, maybe five in total, I think. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think three three by ROM and one by Lori uh, on the far south side. Um, That's but, right. Yeah, go ahead. And um, you know, this was a little Italy. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, um, you know, kind of fun to photograph it in black and white because, again, you can, you know, you can, I, I think, I think the, the components read better in black and white than in color. You can really see that the building at ground level, they'll connect it to whatever is uh, next to it and above it. Um, if they're together, you can tell that they're separate, separate pieces. And with this photograph, I wanted to sort of show it as a center of kind of life in the community. So I was fortunate to get that guy riding the bike who's looking at the entrance uh, or toward the entrance as he rides by. Uh, there's a woman preparing uh, either stuff, some last minute stuff in her bag before she goes in. You see bicycles. There's a you know a break in the cars, thankfully uh, that are there with, that are parked there. Just just to kind of show this as not just a building that's kind of stuck out there, but uh, but <laughs> of a neighborhood. Also, lastly, I also that's not me if you that knows uh, also wanted to not show the whole building i tried shooting the whole building and it just wasn't working so this so here's a case where you just want the essence what is you know what's the lead you know what's the what's the crux and i think with this photograph hopefully uh we found it. yeah i love this shot i mean it's so skillfully framed you know you really see the the single story pavilion of the public library um you know uh, hugging the ground and then above it uh the very crisp lines of the uh very handsome um public housing uh for seniors and families uh above it and um you know and then it, it the building is the antithesis really of um you know the, the terrible public housing projects that uh were isolated single use um, didn't have, you know, a sense of dignity about them, didn't mix uses, um, didn't engage with the street. I mean, this building has learned from all those mistakes. And it's, you know, I think it's great that you were able to incorporate um, people into the shots. And that's one thing in the book that we really try to emphasize, um, right? I mean, the, you know, putting people in the pictures, uh, not, you know, architectural photography, uh, as looking at pure objects um, in many cases, but rather, you know, again, emphasizing that architecture and urban design have an impact on people. Uh, and that's why, you know, like I didn't say, hey, Lee, get rid of that guy on the bike. You know, I was happy that the bike was uh, was in there. Me too. Me too. Now, here's one we couldn't get anyone in because the block wasn't being well traveled by foot when, uh, when I took this photograph, but this is the... Um, the Mamie Till, Emmett Till House, uh, 64th, is a St. Lawrence, I think it is, in Woodlawn. And, um, you know, and, and here, um, you know, when I couldn't find anyone to walk, to conveniently walk in front of the house, um, I just figured, okay, well, the, the image can just photograph a focus on the images that are on the house, which is, of course, Emmett Till uh, in the middle window, and then a tearful uh, Mamie Till Mosley on the, on the edge there. Um, I wanted to show that it was in a neighborhood, right? So uh, you get the edge of the building next to it, to the left, to the right, uh, a little bit of the building next to it, to the left with some buildings in the distance. But, uh, you know, oftentimes the South Side, and I'm a lifelong South Sider, is um, depicted, uh, you know, as this kind of vast wasteland. And, um, and I want to kind of show that there is a neighborhood around this. Uh, there, there, there is something happening around this. And yeah. you know, you get to the, the right moment of the day, and you want to get that cornice, Lit, lit up just the right way. So this is another evening shot. It's a beautiful cornice if you really look at it long enough. Um, at the top and also get a sense of the, the brick limestone layers uh, that are that are there in the face of the house. Yeah, I love this shot. Um, interestingly enough, um, if anyone has the book, um, they will see that this image is actually on the back cover of the book, the blurbs. Um, uh, you know, championing the book or run over it. But the designers for the University of Chicago Press quite intentionally um, 
juxtapose the image of the bean um, on the on the cover and the till house um, on the back cover. Uh, you know, this tale of two cities, the glamorous downtown, the, um, uh, you know, the neighborhoods um, in, in a very different position. And yet, I mean, Lee's picture, I think, really shows that monuments need not be monumental or glitzy or glamorous. They can be an ordinary house, uh, but one that's infused with tremendous meaning and dignity. Uh, you know, and so, I mean, you don't need to be, mod you can, you can be modest and moving at the same time. And that's what this, this house is. Um, interestingly enough, the, this shot accompanies a column, which, uh, talks about how a, a developer from outside the neighborhood just bought this house. He just ran, like, there was no listing uh, you know, in the city that showed this was a, a tremendous African-American landmark. And this guy, um, you know, this bumbling developer was gonna, God knows, you know, God knows what he was gonna do to the house, raise it or who knows. And fortunately, you know, a, a nonprofit stepped in blacks and green and they bought the house and they're going to turn it into a museum. But, um, the point here is that, um, you know, again, it goes back to who is the city for? Who? What are our landmarks? What are the um, what memories? You know, do we celebrate? And um, you know, the Till House, of course, is an essential part of the story um, of of Emma Till, who's you know murder uh, uh, and his mother's decision to show an open casket were you know sparked the civil rights movement and. Um, you know, ultimately laid the groundwork in, in many ways for the work of Martin Luther King, whose uh, day it is today. So, I mean, this is, you know, like, there's no dazzle here. Um, and yet, this is, to me, this is one of the most meaningful, you know, images in the book, because it shows that, you know, in, in an ordinary, seemingly ordinary building, it, it can tell an extraordinary story. And I think that's what Lee's captured so beautifully here. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I've got a few more to show, obviously, but I don't have to show them. I know we want to leave time for people to ask questions. So um, where are we, uh, dear leaders, uh, on, the, on the time clock? Um, I, I would just like to say that the time is up to you guys. We're enjoying every minute of this. So oh. take your time, go forward, and yeah. we'll... Those of us who want to hang around can ask questions at the end, but please continue. Yeah, Lee, if you have other pictures, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know about everybody in the audience, but I always get a big kick out of uh, hearing you talk about your images just because they're so well composed. And so well, keep going. You're, you're on a roll, man. Thank you. Uh, well, this is one that's well known to this audience, no doubt. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House at uh, 5757 Woodlawn. Um, you know, here again, you know, the idea is to pick the time of the day where that uh, that south side of the building can be lit up by the sun. Tough building to photograph in a way because it's so damn long. And um, uh, but the lens did help. And um, you also want to get a sense of the texture of the building. So you know, hopefully, if I've done my job right, you can sort of, particularly when you see in the book, uh, you can get a sense of the of the uh, of, of the brick and obviously the. Um, uh, the flowers spilling over the front, and uh, I, you know, the the building is um, very impressive. If I if I if I took it from the booth across the street and fit it all in the lit, and fit it all in one shot, which with that lens I can do. But here I wanted to kind of show the building coming at you, right, like a almost like a ship charging at you. Yeah. And, um, and if you look real closely to the to the right, although it's covered up, by, at least on my screen it is. Uh, I don't know how to move it. Uh, there's a tour group that's uh, uh, coming up the sidewalk there. But, you know, here's a building that, you know, we we all know was nearly lost to the right himself in the 50s coming back to to uh, to save it and becomes one of Chicago's earliest landmarks, protected landmarks. But uh, yeah, there it is. Yeah, it's a great shot. And, and I think that, you know, again, this is such a subtle um, suggestion of human, you know, of people. Uh, in other words, you know, you I think as I as I remember these this tour group 
at one point was in the foreground of the shot and you waited for them to, uh, am I right? That you waited for them to, you know, sort of mosey down the sidewalk and so they could be in the frame, but they weren't distracting from the building. Yeah, no, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, what really happened, Blair, was that I sent you the photograph with the uh, with the uh, with the tour group right where that planter is. And you oh, had, okay. You had, <laughs> and further down the street, if I had one, and I said yes, I do, and and uh, and there it is. But uh, the tour guide in the photograph that I sent you, he's even kind of gesturing toward the house. Uh, but in retrospect, it was the right choice because uh, the group. I don't know, maybe eight or twelve people in the in the in the in the, in the group. They did kind of cover up some of the elements of that wall there and some of the planters. So this was the right choice. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love the shot, and I love. You're exactly right. It you know the the house really does look like a ship charging through space. It's uh, and that flying that cantilevered roof is like incredible. It's uh, and you know it's it's a beautiful image. Um, any more? Well, um, Thompson Center uh, uh, from uh, uh, right there downtown in Randolph and um, and uh, Clark, uh, as if memory serves. Um, and you know, and, and here's a building that's undergoing, assumed to be undergoing some change at the time. <clears throat> at the time I took this photograph, uh, it seemed destined for um, some kind of um, demolition. Although I never thought that a developer was going to buy that building for any price and demolish it and build another building on top. I didn't, the numbers didn't make any sense, but that's another conversation. But the, but the magic of this building, I mean, again, uh, you know, if you are of a certain age and you remember when this building popped on the scene, it was just incredible. And oops, the most incredible part, ah, I didn't bring it. The, the most incredible part, of course, was the interior, which normally I have right after this. Uh, <laughs> but now Google has bought the building and the question is, what are they going to do to the inside, or particularly what are they going to do to the outside? But what are they going to do to the inside of that very public interior? Uh, how public is it going to be? And what is it going to look like? Uh, when it's done? That's really the question. And it really gets to the heart of the book. Who's the city for? Right now, the building, who's the building for? Right now, the building is for us, for all of us. Who will the building be for afterwards becomes uh, a question that the, re that the redesign of it will certainly answer. Yeah. Um... You're, you have another image, um, which I guess isn't available right now. No, <laughs> that, that's a, um, yeah, anyway. Um, but the point, you know, this, like Cook County Hospital, this building was really in the crosshairs. Uh, Governor Rauner was ready to, you know, sell it off to a developer in a short-sighted way, a uh, short-sighted effort to, you know, you know, like, get a few million bucks for the beleaguered state tre treasury. And, um, yeah, you know, fortunately, um, and J.B. Pritzker was on the verge of doing the same thing. And fortunately, um, uh, you know, uh, he reversed himself and uh, developers came in and um, uh, from the prime group. And uh, ultimately, as you say, they, um, you know, uh, Google is buying the building. It's going to be really interesting to see whether, you know, Google um, keeps the atrium, which is the grand interior space of this building, accessible, you know, to the public. Um, that's that's really the main, one of the main reasons that this building was saved, I think, that we argued, right, that it was worth saving because, the you know we have the the great plazas of downtown along Dearborn Street, the Federal Center uh, for Chicago, and uh, you know Daly Daly Center, and this you know the interior of uh, the Thompson Center is a kind of great indoor plaza, and it uh, particularly is important because of the um, way it acts as a, a focal point for the Pedway system, um, you know the underground tunnels uh, and. You know, you your shots of the interior really capture the the kind of populist um, thinking that was behind the design of the building. You know, you've got like a Sabaro pizza joint, and uh, uh, you know, and you know all the kind of things. So you know, you're absolutely right. So in, in all this high postmodern architecture, um, you, you go inside, and and um, it could be Howard and Clark or 79th and kind of grow in terms of what was actually in the building uh, in, terms, in terms of use. And that's the way it should be. I also, and this is just one man talking, think that the 
the, that uh, Ron, the, the Emanuel administration did something that I think probably saved this building in ways that um, uh, we didn't realize at the time, which is, I think there are four transit connections connected to this building. And right. um, he, he, and they, I can't remember whether he did it by ordinance or how, or how he did it, but he made it clear that whatever happens to that building, all those transit connections have to remain open during the demolition and the construction. Right. And I think that probably spooked off anybody <laughs> who might have been yeah. dumb enough to uh, to listen to Rounder and buy that building and tear it down and build another one on its on its height. I mean, I, I, on its site. I think that having to preserve those transit connections probably made developers go, "Wait a minute." Yeah, and, and I think preserve, and it's, I think it's, they preserve and I think they preserve the building until the cavalry, if you will, could come. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that Helmut Jan, uh, some of Helmut's great works uh, incorporate transit. Uh, you know, there's the, of course, the United Terminal at O'Hare. Uh, there's the CTA um, station at O'Hare, which is a fantastic underground facility. Um, uh, you know, Helmut, as you say, I mean, in this case, uh, incorporating the life of the city, uh, the transit, ultimately helped to save, um, you know, save the building. So, um, oh, now here we have some really bad public space. <laughs> this was this was one that was fun to photograph because, you know, this, so this is City Front Center, and I hadn't thought about this clock uh, in 20 years or more, right? So Blair said, you know, pick this up and, and we'll add it to the book because he's talking about well, you can talk about what you're talking about. So I go to this on a Sunday, Bears game, preseason uh, Sunday. And I thought, I wonder what this place looks like. I'm driving there. I'm thinking, I wonder what it looks like now. And it looks like a word that I cannot say on a family. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of course, you can see it's a, you know, it's a bit of a sundial, 6 o'clock, uh, right at 6 o'clock, and then 9 o'clock at, at 12 o'clock on this photograph. But just dreary. You know, I, I want to say this clock was someplace else, right? And then was moved here, and uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. But it was, it was quite the thing for about fifteen minutes, and then pardon the pun, and then <laughs> and you get what you get here for the next twenty-five years. Yeah, this is um, this illustrates a column about um, the city front center area. It's the area between Michigan Avenue and Navy Pier, and you know the idea of this area was that you were going to have beautiful postmodern architecture, great public spaces. And the kind of deal the city cut with the developers was that they would get to build tall and dense and therefore profitable, but and that they would, you know, create a series of public spaces that were integrated um, physically and were, you know, beautiful. And um, I looked at this 30 years later and, <laughs> You know, it was the public spaces weren't uh, anywhere near what they were supposed to be. Uh, this being a prime example, another example being the um, uncompleted river walk on the north bank of the Chicago River. And in, in part, that is not finished because of the, um, the most infamous uh, unfinished site in Chicago, the Chicago Spire. Uh, which is the you know the giant hole in the ground just uh, just west of Lakeshore Drive. So I mean again you know this is this all goes back to the theme of you know who is the city for um, when you know developers come forth with their beautiful renderings with attractive people you know going through plazas it's it's a sales job and they're trying to uh, you know sell us on uh, hey let me build all this stuff I'll make a ton of money and I'll I'll provide something good for the public. And yet, you know, you look at it 30 years later and the public, you know, gets shafted, um, you know, from with spaces like this that, uh, that you know, that just don't really add anything to the public realm. Should we, should we, uh, oh, well, that's a, okay. Now this is, I believe this is, of course, is Jeannie Gang's uh, St. Regis Chicago Tower. Uh, wonderful shot, Lee, do you want to, you want to talk about it? This was the hardest one to shoot because you got to wait to the right time of the day uh, uh, for it, where you can get the separation, particularly since you know you, you don't have the advantage of color between the three uh, 
towers and <laughs> structural element that sticks out at the bottom near the base. You want to get all that in there, uh, plus the fact that it's you know it's part of a of a, of a complex of, of, of structures, including Jamie's own aqua tower, which you can see to the right there. So um, I had to actually park underneath Lakeshore Drive uh, there and um, kind of wait and work with the sun a, a little bit until until you know until you get it. I, originally, I thought I could shoot it from the Michigan Avenue Bridge, looking east, but the bridge, you know, with a tripod, but the bridge, every bus, every baby stroller makes that bridge uh -huh. so you're getting a lot of blur. So I found this spot beneath uh, Lakeshore Drive, and uh, you know, and uh, pulled over and and, and shot it, and um, you know, kind of want to get the river there as well. Of course, in getting the river at the bottom, uh, I got these cars there, so I apologize for that. I tried to crop the cars out, but I would cut the river off. But I wanted to get this kind of layered effect of the, you know, as many of the multiple layers of Randolph of, of uh, Wacker Drive, but also this building rising. Uh, up uh, and the backdrop that it rises up against. Yeah, um, this is, you know, this shot too speaks to the theme of the book. I mean, this is a very expensive condominium building. It's a top 1% building. And yet uh, this building, you know, contributes a lot to the city. Uh, it's a beautiful object, uh, very creative with the way Jeannie Gang uh, you know, design the building so it looks like it was these three stalks were kind of are curving in and out. But at ground level, it um, it creates a link between the Riverwalk um, on one side and the park at Lakeshore East on the other side. So it's kind of a piece of urban infrastructure that connects these two. Um, it also um, has a, a handsome um, pavilion um that you've captured along uh east wacker drive which is not exactly the most lively not exactly the most lively street in the world so i mean again this shows that you know even a building that is um you know serving uh and housing the winners uh in the economic game uh, can also give something to the public realm. Uh, and it's it's a, an example, I think, of, you know, how a building can be a good citizen uh, as well as a, a beautiful object. Neat. Now, I know we're running short, but I found that photograph that Blair, there you go. That's oh, the- there we go. There we go. Yeah. Building. So yeah. again, it's a super cuts, it's a GNC. I mean, again, uh, the Sprint store. I mean, these are things you can find on almost any Chicago Main Street. And then. There's a Richard Hunt sculpture right there at nine o'clock uh, there too. So that, I think, uh, you know, it, it's that kind of thing that I hope is not lost or totally lost when the building moves on to its next, next incarnation. Yeah, I mean, here's Helmut, Jan, you know, lending drama, visual drama and dignity, uh, you know, to these just ordinary uses. Um, it, it's, I, I mean, I think, you know, critics of the building have always said that, you know, the smells from the food court wafted up <laughs> into the state offices as, as did like, you know, performance performances by musical groups, but I, that's an easily solved problem. I mean, they're, they're going to be able to, you know, you put glass, uh, you know, walls fronting the atrium and, and it becomes, you know, much more functional for, um, Google. Uh, so presumably that, you know, that will happen. But um, yeah, I mean, this, you know, again, shows how architecture can just dignify uh, and dramatize, you know, everyday use. And, uh, you know, that, that um, you know, it's, it's just a great example of, you know, that, that building, that public space, really, it's very important that that be uh, public. That, that it remain public and not just for Google. Agreed. Agreed. Should we take questions? Yes. So we had a question. Yes, I'm going to switch us over. I'm going to switch us over to gallery view so we can see who's asking the questions and who's doing the answers. And we've got questions in the chat. Okay, Dottie, why don't you? Uh, start asking the questions. Okay. Um, 
There was a question about um, Soldier Field. Your thoughts? <laughs> what, uh, um, <clears throat> on how to transform Soldier Field to align with the thesis of your book. Well, um, I, I think it's uh, very unlikely that the um, scheme, the design, the, the the plan proposed by um, recently by the city and uh, a developer to put a dome on top of Soldier Field is going to uh, <laughs> is going to happen. I think the bears are pretty you know, intent on moving to Arlington Heights. So what should the solution for Soldier Field be? Um, I think that um, making Soldier Field um, more modest in scale and more, is better than upzoning it, as it were, than making it bigger. I mean, it's already, it's, more, it's already one of the tallest buildings on the lakefront. And um, so, I mean, if, if I were king, I'd probably get rid of the spaceship and, uh, you know, downscale it and um, make it, you know, a, a site for college football games and um, community uses. Um, I don't know. Lee, what do you think? Uh, same, same. I think we, we either argue that on our editorial pages or on one of my columns that, that rather than to go up, uh, the solution here is to go down, if, if, if you will, uh, that um, it's too big, crammed with too much stuff. And, you know, I'm not sure the scale of those drawings are correct either. Sometimes the people are itty bitty in places where I know they'd be bigger and they're big in places. Anyway, so I don't even think that you could build what's being proposed. But I think that the idea is that it's, it, it's in the museum campus, um, that to theme it, uh, to make it in harmony with the museum campus and the lakefront, uh, is a bit is better than to uh, try to see if you can cram uh, football in that thing again or lure another football team. Uh, yeah, I mean the the, <clears throat> the redevelopment plan, as you as the Sun Times pointed out in its editorial, and one and I wonder who wrote that editorial, uh, <laughs> won't even get Soldier Field up to seventy thousand seating capacity, which is the minimum for uh, you know NF. Uh, for the, for the Super Bowl. I mean, like the World Cup is coming to the United States, you know, the, the soccer's premier event in a few years. And Soldier Field doesn't have enough capacity to host it. So like, there's no World Cup in Chicago. I mean, it's like, what? You know, so um, anyway, so uh, yeah, down, downsizing it. Which interestingly enough was the theme uh, or the idea of Dirk Lohan, the architect of, uh, one of the architects of the renovation 20-some uh, years ago, uh, Dirk had talked about, you know, downsizing it before he teamed up with the Bears and um, Wood and Zapata, the Boston architects who were the principal architects of the renovation. Other questions? Yes. What <clears throat> Trish Morris asks, what difference will the Bronzeville National Historic District make? Lee? Uh, I figured that was going to come my way. You know, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, it's just yet another layer of good. Uh, you know, you know, going back to the National Register status for these buildings that, that they that they that are what was hard hard won uh, uh, battle in the late '80s, early '90s, to um, city landmark status, which took a lot of these buildings, the historic, the eight most historic buildings, out of demolition court. Uh, and preserve them. So it's, it's just yet another layer um, uh, to um, to help not only preserve, uh, but to tell the important stories that, that are there. I mean, it's more than just Louis Armstrong played at the Sunset Cafe. And, and, and I mean, there's like countless, countless, countless stories. And every time one of these uh, designations uh, come, it just equips the storytellers uh, and, and others with yet another tool to tell that rich and layered story. Um, we have a question about the um, Obama Center. Um, it'll, <clears throat> since it'll be the biggest 
new landmark in Hyde Park soon. And um, this attendee is interested in hearing your thoughts. Sure. Not built and the renderings have been selective, so it's difficult and very premature. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I think Lee and I agreed that um, the jury's still out on the Obama Center, and it's going to be hard to judge it until it's built. Um, one of the things, you know, one of the, there are a couple essays in the book about the Obama Center. One is a review of the initial design, which looked pretty forbidding. Uh, and I, you know, was critical of it. Um, I, I think the design became much more graceful and welcoming um, as it went along. Um, I think it's um, an inspired move to close, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's uh, a portion of Stony, right? Uh, or no, Cornell? Cornell? Cornell. Yeah, to close a portion of Cornell to unite the, to eliminate, uh, you know, a road uh, cutting through Jackson Park. I mean, that was, that's kind of the legacy of the highway building binges of uh, the 50s and something that residents of Hyde Park, uh, you know, famously fought against, uh, I think, chaining themselves to trees and doing other things to, uh, you know, prevent uh, the um, uh highway engineers from taking over the park. You know, it's, I mean, we we, we wonder, uh, you know, the big question, of course, has to do with the tower of the Obama Center um, and whether it's going to, you know, just stick out like a sore thumb. It's, you know, it's going to be more than 200 feet tall. And that's considerably taller even than the Science and Industry Museum nearby. You know, it's funny. I mean, I was walking along the south end of the Midway recently. And um, if you look at the U of C campus, there's the kind of urban pattern is that there are a series of towers fronting the Midway um, on both sides now. And so, you know, one thing I wonder is whether the tower of the Obama Center might seem more in keeping with that urban design pattern and kind of form a hinge between the towers that line the Midway and Jackson Park. I don't know, it's pure speculation. Um, I don't know if it's gonna work out like that. Um, I still wanna see the, you know, the stonework that uh, the architects are going to use on the building and, innumerable other details, but Todd Williams and Billy Chen are very talented um, architects. The, you know, performing arts center that they did on the south side of the Midway, um, the arts building is, you know, was won national awards. So let's see, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, let's see what happens. You know, it's under construction now and we're going to see it in a few years. And um, I would just say this. I mean, I, I know there are a lot of people in Hyde Park who, you know, who didn't want it, you know, to be such a tall building and who wanted it to be below the tree line. Um, and Obama, you know, clearly said, I want something visually assertive. Um, the, the conflict over that, the over the center, I think, shows that equity is complex and that often they're clashing visions of equity. So for example, you know, some Hyde Parkers were saying, look, um, we think this is an incursion on a park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. You know, Olmsted wouldn't have wanted a, a tall building like this. But if you looked, if you talk to people, um, you know, who live in other neighborhoods on the South side, they saw the tower as a kind of beacon um, a symbol of African-American ascendance, um, something that would improve their real estate values, their, their pride in their community. Um, that's part of equity too. Uh, and, you know, even, well, anyway. Um, so 
you know, that's, I mean, there, I know there are people who are upset with me, like, why didn't you, you know, say this was too big and, you know, it shouldn't have happened like this. Um, I was willing, you know, to at least consider it rather than reject it um, because of the potential I think it has economically and formally. Um, I don't know, Lee, what are your thoughts? You know, I'm trying to, I know I've mouthed off about this building in my book <laughs> and yeah. High Park Herald, Herald a couple of years ago, and I've been really critical of it, but I think, and I'm not sidestepping the question, but I am, I think I'm going to remain kind of quiet until the thing is, is <laughs> I am curious to see the new park space, how it's, how it's used, uh, yeah. the, the gardens, you know, and, and that uh, Mrs. Obama uh, made sure we're there and, and how they're used, what they look like. Um, so there's a lot I want to see, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to, and I, and I got my concerns about that, about the height of that tower. So as tall as the, it's, it is as tall as the Monotonot building, which is pretty tall in the park. And just to give you a sense, and I'm going to be quiet before I do talk, say, uh, those of us who live far south and you get on the Bishop Ford Expressway and you go past the Pullman Bank, uh, well, I guess it's U.S. Bank, uh, in Pullman, 115th Street and how that thing looks like the tallest building in the world uh, out there. Um, that building is only, I think, 151 feet tall. This right. one is 60 feet tall. So that gives you a sense of, you know, of how tall it might look. <laughs> right. I mean, I think that... In that park. So, so let me just say, so beyond that, I'm closing the books on my conversation about it until it's done. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. I think, you know, the jury's out. We'll see how it works. I mean... One thing I, you know, I've talked, there's an essay in the book about the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, and I, I do think that one of the themes of that building that's very clear is ascendance. And, you know, you're climbing from the experience of slavery, the transatlantic, um, you know, uh, passage, um, and then, you know, to achievement and joy. Uh, and I think that there's potentially the same type of experience in the Obama Center. Um, you know, it's going to be pretty spectacular, I think, to, you know, climb up through that building, to look out over the midway, the, the lakefront, the U of C uh, buildings, the downtown skyline. Um, and those things will be, you know, accessible to the public, even though you will have to pay to get into the museum itself. So. We'll see, you know, we'll see. Um, it's hopefully it's going to be uh, surprise a lot of people uh, who fought it. Other questions? Do we have time for one more question or? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, uh, any thoughts about the proposal for the Tiger Woods uh, golf course in Jackson Park? No, oh, man. Well, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's another who is the city for question. You know, is the city for um, people who can, um, you know, afford the greens fees on a fancy golf course? Is, uh, is the lakefront... Um, you know, beautiful spots on the lakefront, should they be given over to uh, Tiger Woods and that, you know, golf course, or should they remain, you know, great public spaces? And again, you know, this is, I don't know. I, I don't, for, for whatever reason, that proposal, which I think Rom was behind, has lost a lot of momentum. Lee is, I mean, I don't get the sense that it's going anywhere to you. Yeah, then I, you know, I, I don't think so. Uh, it does, it does seem to have lost a lot of momentum. Uh, we, as an editorial board, are just sort of watching the developments behind the scenes. I mean, the biggest concern that we have as a, as as an editorial board at the Sun Times is what are the hidden costs, right? That once you start linking those land masses of the South Shore Cultural Center golf course with the Jackson Park golf course and making it one, my question has always been. Okay, how much are they going to stick up the public for for this uh, for these transportation improvements? I mean, they, with the Obama Library, well, never mind. I'm not going to say it. I'm, 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 <laughs> but, but let's just say that these things have a tendency to have one price tag uh, when they're announced, and then uh, you know, no cost to the taxpayer, and then it turns out it'll cost 
you know, 72 million, 112 million to, to do something. So we're concerned about that. As, as, as critic, um, I don't know. Um, we, I mean, we're, we're, I'm watching. That's all I can say. Um, for you. Okay. <clears throat> we have a question from Tina Hone, who's running for the um, aldermanic position for the fifth ward. We are struggling with preservation of affordable rental housing in some areas while also trying to protect long-term homeowners and encouraging community investment. Any advice? We should be asking you, Aldermanic candidate. We should be asking <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, there are some really good architects in Chicago who, uh, architects like Peter Landon, uh, who, you know, have worked on affordable housing projects for decades and who have done just, you know, God's work in uh, non-flashy, but very beautifully designed, um, uh, you know, complexes, residential complexes. There's one, oh gosh, um, I think it's um, on the, you know, west side of, um, I'm blanking, it, it's just south of the U of C campus, um, and I'm, I, I can't remember the name of it, I'm sorry, but uh, um, Landon Bone Baker is the firm, and there are other, you know, talented firms like Johnson & Lee, um, you know, who did some of the, um, the new residential development along the lakefront at about 40, 43rd Street. Um, those are, you know, very fine projects. They incorporate affordable housing, and they are contextual, they, you know, work with the existing design of uh, the neighborhood. Um, again, you know, I think good architects can really help, um, you know, make the city more affordable and more available to, uh, to all rather than just, you know, the top 1%. Mm -hmm. So my platform would be, you know, more architects, <laughs> more talented architects. You know, it would be great to great to see aldermen, uh, you know, uh, work with them, uh, the the best architects and nonprofits who have done these projects. Indeed, and, and better city policy, enhanced city policy that encourages this kind of market, the, the, the encourages uh, affordable housing uh, more than it currently does. Um, it seems like it's a it's a fist fight uh, whenever. Uh, it's time to build some affordable housing. Architecture can help that pill go down a little better. Good architecture can help right. that pill go down a little better, but you know, ultimately becomes, it becomes, it becomes, it also, it also becomes a policy question. Uh, how much are we willing to go to bat civically, a mayor and alderman, uh, or, uh, especially to make sure that, that affordable housing is built into uh, an, an adequate amount in, uh, uh, of affordable housing is built into any neighborhood redevelopment uh, plan. Yeah, I mean, again, this is a crucial issue, and it does go back to aldermanic prerogative, the infamous custom where, you know, aldermen can control zoning in their wards. Uh, in many cases, we've seen throughout the city, you know, aldermen pressured by constituents who don't want affordable housing or low-income housing in their neighborhoods. And um, this is, you know, really a kind of... Um, um, one of the um, just biggest um, pitfalls of, of aldermanic prerogative, because in, you know, in many neighborhoods, we've seen, you know, uh, you know, just developers put through hell, you know, if they wanted to try to bring, um, you know, low in, some low income housing, or even middle to low income housing. But as Lee says, the um, you know, good architecture and um, can make a difference. And, you know, uh, ROM's co-location projects, the ones that combine public libraries and public housing were um, small but ingenious ways to solve this issue. Because in other words, you know, hey, we're going to put some public housing in your neighborhood, but we're also going to give you a beautiful new public library designed by uh, you know, good architect um, that really helped those sell those projects on the north side. Now, at the same time, I remember people in the Tribune newsroom saying, "Hey, why can't the south side have 
uh, you know, more developments like that. Like, you know, is it only only North Siders get the goodies, uh, the public libraries that go along with affordable housing? So, uh, you know, you, you gotta you gotta play the same game on both sides of town. Um, speaking okay, of Daddy, a question. Go um, yeah, I was just going to say, do we have any more questions? Um, I'd like to ask one. Oh, sure, there you go. Oh, um, yes, uh, uh, I know you mentioned something about some of the architecture <coughs> on, on the L spots. And I just wanted to make a comment and see if uh, I can get any comment about um, uh, we moved here seven years ago and live in Hyde Park, and we live right on 55th Street, where uh, it is so handy to go to the L's and use them. And we use the buses, my husband and I. He goes to work in a couple of different uh, places and stores uh, where he has to use the L and buses a lot. I use the L and buses. I, I teach piano. I have to go to the different music stores to look for music downtown. I love going to different neighborhoods because I love history and so forth. But when did the people stop supporting the CTA system? I mean, I can't believe how many people drive and don't take advantage of the wonderful L system. And, you know, and the Metro train as well. When did the, that stop? the support of those? Well, I mean, obviously the pandemic has really hit uh, transit very hard. A lot of people didn't, you know, want to be in crowded CTA cars with people who might infect them. Um, also, you know, a, it's a reality that, um, you know, homeless people have often camped out in, in the CTA car. Um, yes, I'm on them and I see this all the time, but I still don't understand with the expense and the savings and the efficiency and uh, so forth. Uh, this is a case where instead of the whose city is this, the people haven't supported something that I think is wonderful about yeah. this city. And <laughs> it's just yeah, this, a, this, is a, this is a good question. I think that some of this, uh, you've been here seven years, I think some of this uh, goes back, you know, you know, you know, decades in which in which the CTA, if you're of a certain age, uh, you know, it's been ingrained in you that is not the most dependable thing. Um, I mean, I know it takes its lumps now, but it's but these are just the latest lumps in a history uh, of, of of problems. And if you and if you live on the far south side, far southeast side, uh, you know, it, it can be. It's tough to, to, to use the, the trains and, um, and buses in a regular way to get downtown. Uh, I remember once, I lived in Polk, right? uh, and so I lived right by the Metro stop at 111th Street, at the time right by 115th Street. And uh, I was having lunch, uh, having dinner downtown, missed the last Metro train, which was like 1130 coming my way from downtown to Pullman, and I had to catch the red line and some bus I had never heard of, the 36 bus or something. And it took me two hours and 10 minutes to get from uh, Michigan and, uh, uh, I would, would be Michigan and, and uh, Madison uh, to get to get home. And it only then got me to 115th in Michigan. And then I had to walk over uh, into, into Pullman in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, it was a fun ride. I got a chance to talk boxing with these young men in the back of the bus. Um, but that's once in a lifetime, hopefully. Uh, if that's my commute every night or every day, um, that becomes a, a bit tough. So I think that they're kind of concentric rings. I think the CTA offers one performance if you live within that sort of Hyde Park, uh, maybe Austin, uh, maybe uptown, or a little bit further north, uh, you know, kind of circle. But if you live further south and further south and west, south and east, it's a bear getting around. And you think with the weather in Chicago, with all the things that Blair just mentioned, I'll just take a car. I'll just drive. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is why, you know, the the book um, took on some relevance um, as, you know, the debate over the um, red line extension happened. 
uh, this fall, you know, there were, this was a project that like has been, uh, as Lee's written, uh, you know, this has been promised for decades, decades. I mean, I, old Mayor Daly, right? Uh, even promised this red line extension. Like, you know, this goes back to the, I don't know, 50s or 60s or something. And, you know, then you had like aldermen, you know, going, well, you know, why should we use the TIF money for my district to, you know, fund something on the far south side? But I mean, you know, this was basic equity, transit equity, you know, like how, you know, how can it be that uh, people who live in Wilmette, Oak Park, Skokie, uh, you know, have better transit access than people in the city of Chicago? That just doesn't, you know, cut it, uh, you know, ra better rapid transit access. So, I mean, you know, this really, I think, for me at least, you know, the equity issue really informed what I wrote um you know about the the um uh red line extension issue because it it just you know who is the city for it's you know what kind of opportunities what kind of equal opportunities are we giving or unequal opportunities are we you know affording people um you know those opportunities have to do with uh, their ability to work their ability to have good lives so they're not, you know, spending two hours a day commuting to go to school, um, any number of things. So, you know, again, um, the book was, uh, you know, uh, put together, uh, you know, 10 years of columns uh, in the, the, the teens, but it um, perhaps had a little relevance uh, today, you know, with um, the... The red line extension debate and also really the um you know the mayoral campaign that we're in right now uh i mean you know violence uh is is clearly the top issue um but um you know building a more equitable chicago should be on the agenda um it's you know again you can't have a great city if you don't have a just city you know a fair city and that's really um uh, you know what we're getting at here uh in the in the book and um I, I think that's probably a good place to end um you know especially uh on martin luther you know king day um you know you know yes. Dr. Blair, King, Blair i completely agree um you can't have a just city without a fair city and it is an excellent place to end um and we thank both you and Lee Bay. We've already taken up a huge amount of your time. This has been one of the most phenomenal book club meetings we've ever had. And mm -hmm. I can't thank you both enough. Of course, we know Lee. Um, he's done at least two programs for the Historical Society before. Um, but Blair, it, it has been a pleasure both to, ha to have both you and Lee tonight. Your interactions, um, reminded me somewhat of the Siskel and Ebert um, interactions where you just played off each other so beautifully. I think we've all been so wonderfully informed tonight. And so I will give one final plug for the um, Hyde Park Book Club sponsored by the Hyde Park Historical Society in the Chicago Hyde Park Village. You can go to our website to learn more. But again, I don't want to detract from anything that's gone on tonight. Thank you, Blair, and thank you, Lee. It's been a wonderful evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for having us. It was thank really you. a great, great audience. Great. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Blair. Good to, good to see you. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Dottie and Mike.